Well, hey everybody, welcome back. Video number six on loading for this here seven millimeter PRC. We're not doing any brass prep, that's all done. Today's video is part two on the research on the Hammer Hunter tip 162 grain bullet. We have 20 of them left. So initially what I was going to do was load a ladder in H1000 up under where we left off last time, which was 70.8 grains. 70.8 grains of H1000 gave us 3,195 feet per second, an SD is 7.1, an ES is 17.3, and a 0.6 inch group. Wasn't disappointed in that. In fact, I was kind of happy to see it because it was the only good group of the entire day. And if you call a 0.6 inch group really that good of a group, that was all she wrote. So my initial intent was to go under that and uh, just take all 20 of those bullets and load ladder under the 70.8, looking for a possible sweet spot or a plateau. And a little bit of prodding and some input from some friends and viewers, I decided to come back to the N560 as well. So now we've got 20 bullets. We're going to be splitting them real small groups here. We're going to have nine and nine and then one cider follower for each because we do need to follow the bore. It's uh, pristine, clean, down to bare steel once again. We're going to load a short ladder, three, three round groups above where we left off at 66 grains last time in N560. Probably going to bump the seating depth a little bit deeper this time. See if that makes a difference. Everyone says, hey, man, they like to jump a lot. When I look at the load data from Hammer Bullets on their spreadsheet, they definitely seat them shorter than I do. So I think as just a matter of uh, discovery, we're going to push them back just a little bit more, maybe another five thousandths or something like that. Maybe jump them like 40 or 42 thousandths and see, see what it's like there. Our OAL is still going to be much longer than Hammer shows on their. Um, Google Docs spreadsheet from their website. Anyhow, like I said, this brass has been deep primed, cleaned, dried, annealed. It's been full length sized. It's been mandrilled to 282, the necks, trimmed slightly and only a few, only had about a half thousandth average growth, uh, growth this time. Trimmed what I needed to, nipped them, debird chamfered what I needed to, clean them out once more, and then primed them with these CCI BR2 large rifle bench rest primers. So that gives you an idea. There's not a whole lot to discuss on this. I did discover that I did not completely erase the carbon ring in my chamber the last time around. It's so hard to measure by eyeball, but there wasn't much there. There was just the shadow of it, no actual buildup. This time I got it scrubbed right down. There's no carbon ring left in there at all. So we'll see if that makes a difference at all. I'm not certain it will, and I'm not certain we'll know what our difference is today because obviously we're changing a seating depth along with these powder charges. So this will be a whole new thing all the way around. Rifle's been performing very well considering its price point. It's probably a good time to talk about the machining in that barrel. It's ugly. There's no other way to say that. It's ugly, but it shoots well. So it's kind of odd, right? Like you've got this terrible looking machining, um, which you'll be looking at here probably as I speak. Some of it's got awful. The, the tracking in the grooves themselves, Frank the Tank, he brought it up. He said, it looks like there was a chip out of the tooling and it was just leaving steel behind. And that's probably what has happened here. That's odd. I've never seen a barrel with that much striation or um, topography, whatever you want to call it, with hills in the grooves but it still shoots good. So, you know, when I set out to buy this rifle, I did so knowingly. I, you know, I was very well aware that people bag on this rifle, that it's a budget deer getter and it'll never shoot well. But then I watched a couple of people shoot them and they shot them pretty well. So I thought, mm, I'm going to take the gamble and run the risk and see what happens. And so far with the adjustments I made to it right out of the box with lapping it and letting the stock Rebedding and uh, torquing down of that Picatinny rail and adjusting the trigger, it seems like it's paid off. It's been very consistent. I haven't had any shift or any movement. Um, my scope is my zero has been on every time. Uh, wherever I left it, that's where I picked up again. And I'll, and I'll need these couple of cider filers here to get us back because I, I did some screwing around last time and dialed it up. So I don't fear for that rifle not making it. As odd as that sounds, with as poor as that bore condition really is. And another thing I should talk about, and I guess I'll throw the video footage in here too, is what I didn't show you in that last video regarding the condition of this bore is the last inch or so of barrel down at the crown, there's all kinds of pitting in there, very fine pitting. And it looks to me, and this is my amateur 
non-rifle builder perspective, it looks like during some kind of process, prepping or cleaning, etc., some kind of acidic compound got sprayed, oversprayed, and made it down the muzzle because it's the only area of the rifle that's affected by it, and it's a definite pitting. It looks like old school rust pitting that you would see maybe in an old world Milserp rifle that's been sitting in a armory for an extended period of time, not oiled. I never saw rust like that in the bore, but you see the effect of some form of uh, what I would consider probably chemical pitting that's in the end of that. And I'd really like someone to chime in and tell me what they think of that, or if they think that came from the manufacturer that way, or was this the screwball at the store or um, the supply company that was messing around with this before it made it into my hands. Anyhow, all that aside, it still shoots pretty well. This rifle shot quarter inch groups and a whole bunch that were under a half. So does a guy really go complaining about it? Not really. It does collect an awful lot of copper due to the way those grooves are and some of the uh, tooling chatter. That's problematic. But if you're a guy like me that cleans religiously, it, it's really never going to end up becoming a problem. You're aware that the condition exists, and so you erase it every time. This rifle gets fired 50 rounds, and it gets stripped down to bare steel. That's how I roll. Everybody's different. I know guys that haven't cleaned their deer rifle in probably more than 15 years. And you know what? They still shoot their deer. So it's whatever your habit is, that happens to be mine. Not much else to tell you here. These are the components. H1000, N560, five times fired brass, are hammer 100 tipped, 162 grains, CCI BR2 primers, and here is today's workup. Starting out here with N560. There's our new seating depth, 2.642 on my comparative tool. Okay, now H1000. All right, then predictions. I honestly don't know what to think right now with the H1000. We're loading quite a bit lower than where we left off or, or actually where our starting load was last time. 
but we got to 3,195 feet per second with that load. So with a little luck, even the lowest of these loads will be coming in somewhere right around 3,150. I'd like to see that. I'd like to see us develop a good group somewhere between 3,150 and that 3,195 that we found at 70.8 grains. On the N560 side, is anybody's guess. I don't think it shot that good of groups last time. I didn't actually go back and look just now. We left off at like 3,120 feet per second at 66 grains. So here we're loading a half grain more and then three tenths more than that, and then three tenths more than that. My hope is to get somewhere north of 3,160, 3,175. That'd be great without seeing pressure. H1000 is the only powder so far that's given us that kind of velocity without any pressure sign. Everything else at some point had a heavy bolt lift. So anyhow, my predictions are we're going to find a decent load in H1000, or at least I pray. N560 could be the savior and ends up, you know, giving us great speeds and a good group. That'd be awesome. This is the only 20 bullets I had left. So if I'm going to continue to experiment with these, I'm going to have to order some more. Sort of up in the air on that. Anyhow, that's all for now. Take them to the range. Make them fly straight. Okay, made it out to the range. Our usual setup. Got a target at 100 yards. Shot marker system up and running. And a live target cam. Well, have a look at this brass now. Not much to see, really. Uh, the only ones with any type of mark on them is the three in your upper right that you're seeing there. Probably tough to make out in the video. That was 67.1 grains of N560, which gave us 3,163 feet per second. But a heavy bolt and some swipe on the brass. So 66.8 grains of N560 is where we topped out. On to a quick look at these targets. H1000, obvious clear winner here. The group on the far right in the red circle there is the uh, 70.5 grains of H1000, which gave us 3,148 feet per second. SD of 5.6 and ES of 13.5 and a 0.3 inch group. That's our winner. 3,148 ends up being a tad slower than I had estimated, and perhaps it was the change in the seating depth. It appears that with monolithic bullets, with PDRs or drive bands that if you seat them deeper, sometimes you get that gas blow by pressure loss, which equates to lower velocity. My predictions were to be around 3,200 feet per second. And here we top out at where I thought we were basically gonna start at around 3,150. Great group, shoots real well. It's very consistent as you can see across those three loads. I like it, but I don't know if it's enough to push me away from that 195 grain burger EOL. We're going to have to look at that down the road. On the N560 side, it's tough to tell what's really going on here other than horizontal, vertical, horizontal. I'm not a big fan. I, I don't like what it's doing. I don't have a clue as to why it's so different than how H1000 works with this load, but the target doesn't lie and the numbers are the numbers. N560 did get us up to 3,163 feet per second at 67.1 grains, but we were over pressure with a heavy bolt lift and some swipe on the brass. I'm not a fan of that, so I won't be going back that way. If we go back to where it was under pressure, which was only 0.3 grains less, we were at 3,139, which is slower than our better load in H1000, which didn't have any pressure signs. So clear winner here, H1000 all the way. N560 is kind of done here. Like I said, the biggest thing going forward is going to be determining which bullet I'm going to hunt with or will I examine yet one more. 
It's been a while since I put a video out. This one is very late on getting to you all. I've uh, been very busy with work and so things happen and it's not easy to get all this done. And part of having the time constraints I've been under may lead me also to fall back onto that 195 grain burger just for the sake of I already have loads ready to go. So in a way, I think I've kind of reached the end of the line where I'm looking at either this um, Hammer Hunter 162 grain or the Burger 195, and I'm just going to have to come down to finally selecting one. I have a whole bunch of the Burger 195s. That makes that real easy. I don't have anything else I have to do. I have everything I need to do. And if I want to go with these hammers, I'm going to have to buy some more of them, perhaps a couple boxes more so we can get some more shooting time in and then be prepped for the hunt. So more on that later. I need to kick it around and see which way we're going to go there. Well, thanks for coming by, everybody. I appreciate you being here. There is more content on the way, albeit at a slightly slower pace, and I apologize for that. I hope to catch you in the next video, and until then, take care and shoot straight.